attempt. Yes, a full screen there. <laughs> Hiya, over to you. So, hello everybody. Um, my name's Bradley Whale. Um, I'm a equine osteopath. And some of you may know or, or not know, um, I've also invented a, a, a two-part saddle. I'm not here to talk about the two-part saddle. I'm here to talk about the uh, compensation patterns and uh, various elements between horses and riders and the common musculoskeletal complaints you get to see and deal with. Uh, the reason why, why I can talk about this is because I wrote the book on equine biomechanical compensation patterns many, many, many years ago. Um, I have also just finished writing a, a, a new theory on uh, equine spinal mechanics, uh, which is uh, I'm going to start talking about, not today, I'm going to start talking about later on in the year, um, which would be quite nice and quite in, uh, quite clever and hopefully uh, improve the industry a little bit. And on another level is that I've also worked as an elite athlete on kind of competed as an elite athlete so I kind of know what's going on in terms of uh, compensation patterns and what to look out for what not to look out for um, myself so so yeah as well as many 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 other things in my life but that's kind of by the by so let's let what we're going to do is we are going to do a, a lovely two-hour lecture although knowing me it ends up going on for a lot longer I do have a habit of, of waffling on um, because we've, we've, we're touching a subject which is very dear to my heart. Um, I absolutely love this subject. Um, it's full of nuances and kind of lovely details, but it's, it's, it is massive. And trying to kind of encompass a, a, such a complex relationship between a horse and rider in two hours is, is unbelievably difficult. Um, and I can, as everyone can probably detest, I can waffle on for hours about it um just in one small section so if you get me talking about the pelvises or hips or ankles or anything like that that's me gone for the next kind of hour so i warn you of that so you may need to pull me up a little bit but um what we're going to do is we're going to try and briefly hit and skip along just like a stone skipping across water we're just going to lightly touch a couple of subjects um just so that we can all uh, have a, a lovely conversation. If you wanted me to go deeper into certain things, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, so yes, so these are the what we're going to touch today, which is basically the saddle fit for the horse, saddle fit for the rider, musco common musculoskeletal problems for horses, common musculoskeletal problems for riders, and exercises um, which you can do or suggest um, to horses and riders, um, because obviously you're looking at the relationship. Um, so. Uh, first things first. Ooh, go on. Sorry, could I ask you a question? There's a question come up. Uh, yep. What What is the title of your book, please, Bradley? Oh, um, oh God. Uh, Equine Biomechanics, The Secret to Competition Success. It was written in 2008, 2009. So it is very, very old. I really wouldn't bother um, kind of reading it. It's very dull and boring. Um, it truly is. Um, it's it's not interesting at all. It's it's when in my younger years when I kind of just waffled on for a lot of rubbish, really. Um, but it's it's if you want it, I can always send over copies and whatnot, so it's never an issue. Um, we can always kind of sort that out later. Thank you. And just one more, one more, because it yep. relates to a question that somebody's uh, asked me earlier. Uh, this week, the uh, assignment that that they've had was to place the riders in the saddles and do some evaluations. And uh, my technique is to put them so that put the rider so that they feel their bony triangle, which is the two seat bones and the pubic bone. And when they find that and they retest their stability by pushing them from the each side, and they find that in that triangle they are way more stable so that would appear to be the neutral pelvis but the riders don't always look like the pelvis is vertical so maybe later on if you're covering that you could come back to that i mean uh, does a gymnast for example have a neutral pelvis when they're not quite in when they're not quite vertical so i'm a little uh, I'd like right, to okay, expand okay. on that a little bit Right. So that, that I'm more than I'm more than happy to expand on that. That is going into uh, very deep um, anatomical uh, knowledge or or anatomy of 
the pelvis. Um, and the pelvis is, is a very complex bone um, on a variety of different levels, partly because the way we commonly measure um, the neutral pelvis is from ASIS, which is the anterior superior iliac spine to the PSIS, which is the posterior iliac spine, basically, um, or the PS, uh, posterior superior iliac spine. Um, now, the bony bit on the end is where your dimples would be, little hard bits of bone, just kind of where your sacrum is, just go out to the sides. There's little kind of hard bony nodules you'll feel. That is called your PSIS, or sacroiliac joints is what they're also called as well. Um, now, the problem is with that um, is that depending on the pelvic shape, and we do touch on this later, um, whether you have what we call an android pelvis, gynecoid pelvis, platypoid pelvis, anthropoid pelvis, there are four generic types, um, but I go into detail in terms of that, we likely touch on it, um, the, depending on your pelvic shape, changes the the angles of the the neutral pelvis or how we commonly measure the neutral pelvis um so you can be doing the triad um and put the pelvis into neutral but yet the pelvis from the lateral view and the measuring from the asis to the psis as a horizontal line suddenly looks out of kilter and it doesn't look horizontal um so there are things like that which we also have to be aware of. Um, so yes, we are, but we can go into a lot more detail onto that if you so want. Um, but that's just briefly touching that. Thank you. We're not bored. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 that's that's why I say the pelvis is a is a hugely complex subject um, because it's it's you've also got as I say the different pelvic shapes. You've you've then got all of the pelvic an abnormalities um, which can occur, um, and then you've you've got also uh, muscle contractions and psoases and various things like that, which we all have to deal with. Um, so yeah, well I could I'm more than happy to go into a lot more detail on that if you want. Well, we were just relating, well, we were just introducing the pelvis as it relates to the saddle and saddle design. And, you know, just in terms of having the riders put in their own saddle, then when we put them in what we believe to be neutral pelvis or that bony triangle contact, yeah. uh, what happens? And we've been looking at that. So anyway, over to you. One of, one of the big factors with the bony triangle um, is actually uh, the position of the genitalia. Um, that makes a massive difference um, because sometimes you can put somebody into a neutral pelvis or a neutral pelvic position, but because of their genitalia, um, you can't actually put them in a position, into that position, because they end up, um, in the most polite way possible, they end up kind of mashing themselves, um, which is uh, quite uncomfortable for everybody, really. Um, so nobody wants mashed bits. Um, so yeah we that's also another uh, area which you have to so trying to fit a man in terms of the the neutral pelvis and the, and the triad um is going to be um a, a very different experience um is the most polite way of describing that so um right um so uh, just cracking on, uh, what is saddle fitting? Um, so as we kind of say, you, you've, you've seen the lovely triangle on, on the right-hand side. Um, saddle fitting is unbelievably difficult. Um, as, I've, as I've openly tell everybody, saddle fitting is not just a science. It is also an art. Um, it is the perfect kind of amalgamation um, of pardon me, um, physicality and psychology. Um, uh, now, the problem with fitting a saddle is, unlike any other sport in the world, um, you are having to put an inanimate object between two very different, uh, physically, very different emotionally, very different mentally, um, creatures. Now, th they have very different demands. Uh, such as the demands for the horse are very different to the demands of the rider. This means that you as a saddle fitter, your job is is in some aspects ruled by science and physics, but in, in the other is also ruled by feel and 
your your eye, your experience, um, and your kind of um, I, w- I don't necessarily want to say gut instinct, but it, there is an element of um, feel, uh, something which is very much deeper uh, than just pure mathematics and science. You know, if we look at um, a sport such as cycling, uh, that's having, say, a bike fitted to a rider. Uh, that's just the interaction of the rider with an inanimate object, the bike, and then an inanimate object, which is the road. Um, so it becomes very, very easy. Your job is unbelievably difficult. Um, so don't uh, underestimate the fact that you are having to deal with three different demands, which is essentially the customer's demands, what they want, you know, if they want a pretty saddle or they want the new best thing. Um, you've also got to look at the welfare of the horse. Um, is this the right saddle for the horse? And then you've got the manufacturer um, and what the manufacturers are actually producing um, and whether it is, it's whether manufacturers are producing good enough products or, or variations of enough products. It's not just about whether they're good enough. It's, it's are there enough, enough options out there and are the manufacturers justifying their products to you? Um, so, yeah, don't underestimate how difficult your job is um, and how complicated it can be. Now, the other difficulty you have as saddle fitting community um, is that which theory do you use? Um, there are various different theories and different concepts of how to fit a saddle um, and how you should fit a saddle not only to uh, to a manufacturer's specifications, but also how you fit a saddle to a uh, horse as well. You know, there's, di- there's different arguments to be how do you fit a, a, a a horse with a very curved back to a horse with a very flat back. Do you fit them the same? Do you use the same theory or do you use a different theory? There are various individuals out there, myself included in this, I will open up my hands, um, that have different theories on how to fit saddles. Um, Now, as we say, the evidence that there are so many different theories of fitting and manufacture gives an indication to the complexity which you are having to deal with. Um, so the best answer to any question when you're fitting saddles is it depends. I know it sounds very odd and it sounds like a cop out, but it's being informed, it's being knowledgeable, it's having as much information in your armory as possible so that when you go out to see an individual horse, you have as much data as possible and as much information in your back pocket to turn around and go, right, this horse, in this situation, we need to apply this. And it may be actually uh, a combination of different theories um, at different times. Um, I openly turn around and say, you do not fit a young horse the same as you would an older horse partly because of the physiology, partly because of the uh, history of those creatures. But as I say, we can talk about that uh, another time if so required. Um, So the one thing, as I said, um, you've also got to understand that when you do your job well as a saddle fitter, um, you will not get praise. You will be unknown. You will be forgotten about. You will be... Uh, unvalidated um, but when it is done badly um, you will get the book thrown at you it will be painful it will be obvious you will be blamed you will get cussed you will get thrown under the bus you will you know, it's all the negatives because everyone wants to blame an inanimate object um, and they don't actually want to blame themselves or anything like that but equally you have to understand that when you almost have to take confidence um, and knowledge that when you do it well, you will be unknown, you will be invalidated. Um, and that is almost kind of like a badge of honor. Um, and it just sounds very odd, but if you do your job well, nobody's going to talk about you. Nobody's going to scream from the rooftops. They should do. I honestly believe they should do. Um, but you won't. It's the reality of the industry is that you will kind of be put to the side and, oh, it's not, it's not, not really complicated so you know you've just done your job and it's like no it's actually you've done a lot more than your job so it's get very comfortable with the fact of kind of being sidelined quite often that doesn't mean that doesn't invalidate it that doesn't make it um any less important it's just you know 
very rarely do you hear about these saddle fitters which are held up in such high esteem. You know, they're all missed, basically, because um, it's not the manufacturers. You know, you hear about Fairfax saddles. It's not really about Fairfax saddles. It's about actually the saddle fitters going out and doing it. You know, you look at the big competition, big competitors, Charlotte, um, you know, they, it's not the company. It's not, it's, it's not the, um, main brand which is doing it. It is the individual fat, uh, saddle fitter. It is the relationship, how that individual fitter knows that individual rider, that individual horse. So your power is in your relationships. So don't forget that because they're very important. Um, oh, uh, comment, sorry. Uh, uh, Steph says, thank you from all the saddle fitters here. <laughs> That's <laughs> no problem. Um, so, <laughs> it's going to get me blush now. Um, so, first things, when we start looking at saddle fitting, um, there is no universal fit for the horse. Um, anybody who turns around and says, oh, you know, this saddle fits every horse, no, it doesn't. Um, it has the potential to fit every horse. Of course it does, but everything has uh, the potential, whether it actually does or is, is kind of down to proof of the pudding. Um, now, as we know, every horse is different, just like every rider is different. So there's not one methodology or one way which is going to fit everything. Um, but that being said, there are patterns of movement, um, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and there are structural observations which we can, to some degree, allow some predictability. So, for example, if you've got a horse which has a slight bum wiggle, um, or not a lameness, uh, but an unlevelness, um, partly caused by, for example, a leg length discrepancy, um, a structural leg length discrepancy, um, then you can see that pattern of movement, in which case then, because you know it is a structural observation, um, you can adapt around it. Now that becomes a prediction. Now that prediction is then increased because the next horse you see might have a slight leg length dif difference, but it is nowhere near as bad. You know, for example, the first horse might have a five centimeter leg length difference. Um, the second horse may have a two centimeter leg length difference. It's still the same problem. It's still the same leg, which is kind of structurally wrong. But that means you can then do the same thing, albeit at a reduced level or a reduced kind of range, um, in order to help that next horse. So as I say, there are, every horse is unique, every relationship is unique, but there are patterns of movement, um, which we can to some degree allow for some predictability. Um, but they are, they are uh, the way to look at it is they are guide rails. They are not fixed. They don't kind of hold you into position. They very much kind of, kind of like the white lines on a road. They just kind of keep you in the straight and narrow, but you, you've got some deviation within those boundaries. Um, that's the polite way of kind of looking at uh, these kind of patterns and, of movement and structural observations. Um, so first and foremost, we're going to start off with the horse. Um, now I'm a, anybody who knows me kind of quite well is I'm, I'm very hot on observations. Um, if, if anybody sees me actually work as an osteopath, they generally get shocked that I spend a good 45 minutes to an hour observing the horse. And I mean, observing it walking trotting in the stable on the lunge being ridden being tacked up being led from the stable to outdoors being led from the stable to the arena everything is being observed i am looking at absolutely everything i'm looking at walking up a hill i even go out and look at its field i literally the first hour for me is just pure based observations so Anything, I will look at it very much from, from that point of view is you have got to spend a, a, not necessarily a long time, but you, your, your first port of call is observations. So when we are looking at horses, I am certainly looking at are there any leg length differences? And leg length differences can be, and later on we do talk about this, um, leg length differences can be structural and they can be functional. So you can have a leg length difference, which means that 
Both hoof angles are exactly the same length and same height and same angle, but yet the knees on the front leg are at different heights. That indicates then, because the feet are in the theoretically the, the same symmetrical position, there is a leg length difference in the cannon bone or the humerus and so on and so forth, which is causing the, the difference. That in turn will then affect the shoulder movement and the shoulder position. Um, but equally, if you've got hoof angles, which are different heights, and you have knee angles, which are different, or knees, which are different heights, what that is going to knock on and affect your saddle fit. But then, as the horse is getting the hoof changed or corrected by the farrier, that then is going to change your saddle fitting, of which then that becomes almost a predictable ratio of, because they're changing the hoof angles, you've got to go back more regularly to keep adjusting and tweaking the saddle fit. Pretty obvious, really, isn't it? Um, then we also look at things like sternum deviation. Um, now, how you do that is that's actually a very simple thing. You can put your hands onto, a, sit in, not sit, but squat in front of the horse's chest, and you can actually feel uh, the sternum, and you can see it if there's a slight deviation. So it's going off to the one's left or right side. Um, now, that is particularly important because that the sternum deviation can occur because of a leg legs difference, but it can equally occur um, because of a muscular pull, uh, such as tight pectoralis and, and so on and so forth, because of an over-dominance in training. Now, what is also interesting in this is because the sternum does or can slightly deviate, because you're talking about the bony ring of the rib cage, you can also have slight deviations of the spinal uh, column. Uh, not kind of massively common, but you can get a what we call a scoliotic curvature uh, within the horse. And that is also reciprocated into the sternum because of the bony ring. Um, so that is also worthwhile being aware of. Um, now, the other thing is also... Simple things. There's recently been a, a piece of research done by Centaur Biomechanics, which has been talking about rug rub. Um, we've been uh, harping on about that for years uh, in terms of rug rub. Is The shoulder which the rug is rubbed on is an indication that the saddle or the, the, the uh, rug is slipping off uh, on the opposite side. Um, because it's, the rug is pulling over, say, to the right-hand side, the rug rub is also occurring onto the left shoulder. Um, now, that is is another observation which you can do quite easily without any, you know, there's no poking, there's no prodding. Um, the other elements are wither and bum height. Now, that is going to play havoc when fitting a saddle um, in terms of if the bum height is higher than the wither, um, because that forces the rider more onto the shoulder and so on and so forth. All of these things basically prove and, and set you up to almost a, a, a predictive way of how to balance the saddle. You know, it, it, I can always, I always use extremes because if the bum height is, for example, two foot higher than the wither height, um, you put a rider on top of that, they're going to topple forward, um, because everybody understands extremes. Um, so in which case, you know that you're going to have to lift up the front end um, in order to try and balance that rider a little bit in, in modern uh, conventional based saddles. So all of these factors, all of these observations are going to impact you um, and set up a, the beginning of a, of a process or a pattern um, to start fitting saddles and start making them more effective and, and move better for the rider uh, for the horse sorry um the next thing i do is is after observations and looking at horses and, and being very nerdy and geeky is then we start looking at movement patterns now i generally then i look at after observing i look at the horse what what, what i certainly call is pure um so that means that there's no rider on top there is no um, kind of influence of the rider or tack or anything like that coming on board. Um, I just want to see the pure movement of the horse. Uh, I want to see if there's any lameness or shortness of, of kind of leg length, uh, of leg length, uh, leg movement. Um, 
I want to see if there's any kind of bum wiggle. You can always tell that with the tail swishing off to one side, but it's not always. Um, the other thing I also oddly do is when horses are being, you know, you do a walk away and trot back and walk away and trot back. I also stand to the side um, and I generally try and watch the horse breathe. Um, it's quite an uncommon thing by a lot of therapists or a lot of people, but I want to watch or see how that horse breathes. Now, it's particularly easy in this time of year because it's cold. Um, so you can see the, the, the puffs of air coming out of the nostrils and various things like that. Um, the reason why I want to see the horse breathe is I want to see how the diaphragm is working, uh, whether the horse is doing little short, sharp breaths or if it is, kind of more a, a relaxed breathing um, and the legs are tracking up through. Now I'm looking at all of these in fits and stages. I'm not just looking at one and then looking at the next bit and then looking at the next bit. I'm looking at grades of all of them. So for example, a shortness of a stride and a sudden shortness of breathing pattern um, kind of logs into my brain and you suddenly go, right, okay, well, also this horse is young and it's, it's bum high. Oh, right, okay. Uh, there's something going on here. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that we need to panic, but it's, it's, you're starting to create, create little, uh, kind of bits of information, almost kind of like, um, Hansel and Gretel's little kind of trail of smarties to lead them home. You're trying to lead these little trails of smarties in order to send you to a, a, a diagnosis, um, and ultimately then a, a plan of how to fit uh, the saddle and, and also how to take, how to evolve the saddle fitting process for the future. Um, now this is just a video on, on how you've got a lame horse. I'm just going to do that again. So you can see there, you know, You've got a couple of things going on there in terms of uh, the video, uh, that also uh, due to the environment as well, or potentially due to the environment. Um, so that's that's kind of another thing which we need to consider is the environmental impact. You know, if you're leading a horse out and it's kind of winding and rainy and, and horrible, that will impact what you're going to observe and what you're going to see in terms of the mechanical movement. Um, I've seen horses that when they, go, they come out on a cold day, um, they're stiff as a board. Um, they warm up, they're absolutely fine. Uh, they've had x-rays, there's no arthritis. It is just because the horses are stiff and it is because of the muscular complaint. Um, so then we have to treat that. There's all, we also then subsequently found out through all of that, we found out uh, something which was physiologically wrong with the horse, which I will touch base later on um, because we are talking about mechanics but i also must talk about the physiology the physiological aspects which can affect the muscular uh, aspects of saddle fitting um, but i will come back to that later um so the problem we have when we're kind of as saddle fitters trying to go out and fit saddles um we have a chicken and egg scenario um which is Observations can cause variations in movement patterns and movement patterns can cause changes in it, in what we observe. So what we mean by that are if you are looking at a horse and the muscles are asymmetrical in terms of one side is built up and the other side isn't, that will cause a variation in movement pattern. Of course it will, because you have that. Now the problem is, is also that movement pattern is going to exaggerate the original observation as well so the same horse you are you are in this chicken and egg um and how do we break that well we're going to come back on to that later uh, of how to break it but or how to kind of correct that but this is the problem which you are in um a chicken and egg scenario what you observe that has a variation or ha can cause variations in the movement and the movement can cause changes into the observation so we definitely need to be fully aware of, of both sides of the coin when we're dealing with the horse and its, and its kind of various problems. 
Right. So. Right. So the the element of being a saddle fitter um, is basically knowing what can and cannot be changed. Now, this is this is a very complex subject which we just need to talk about. Is knowing not only knowing what can and can't be changed by mechanically, but also knowing what you as a saddle fitter can and cannot change. It is also understanding what effects of those changes are going to be. Now this is this is very, very important to 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 really understand on a, on a very deep core level. Um, so we're going to go through a couple of examples here, which is what can and cannot be changed. And this is where we're talking about, okay, is it, are you dealing with a horse which has had a structural or has a structural abnormality, i.e. a leg length difference? Or are we dealing with a previous damage to the deep digital flex, flexor? Those are things which cannot be changed. Those are things which will forever affect the movement of the horse and potentially the performance of the horse. You cannot change that as a saddle fitter. That is obvious, as you know. But what that means is you will then be dealing with those compensation patterns. Now, those compensation patterns... Sorry, I uh, just got a message from a client about uh, a gout treatment. Um, that's not my phone, so I apologize. I just went quiet. Um, so it is about understanding the effects of those changes, which you will need to do to that saddle to compensate for the compensation of the injury. Now, if we are, to, for example, to give you a scenario which is a deep digital flexor tendon on the front right leg, um, that will cause muscular imbalances that will cause uh, shoulder rotation changes that will cause stride length changes all of these things you then compensate the saddle for those changes the horse feels better the horse it starts moving better the horse suddenly starts being put under more pressure by the rider Inadvertently, then, and this is a this is a, a not a reality check, but this is you've you've almost got to run your your the effects of those changes. You have you have suddenly allowed that rider to suddenly push that horse a lot harder because sometimes people are greedy. Um, that means that by doing the right thing on some level, you are also loading up. And running a higher risk of causing re-injury. Um, now, uh, it's not about kind of telling you and saying no, you shouldn't do this or anything like that. But it is it is knowing the full extent um, of the possibility of what you do as a job and what you can do to help and improve those horses. But you can are I, also uh, sorry, Bradley. Can I can I just ask something or make an observation? I found yeah. that in the past when I was working with people that you make them comfortable so you make this big effort and you know they could be crippled when you get there and then yep. suddenly you go for the next uh, session so you've made them feel so much better and they've been gardening and they said oh you know so you know I've yep. made myself just as bad so that just uh, that's that exactly what I mean is yeah yeah that's exactly what I mean is, is is it is talking about and have and having this open, honest conversation with your peers, with colleagues, so on and so forth, where it is okay to sometimes not uh, feel too comfortable about making positive changes. You know, everybody yeah. wants to make positive changes, but sometimes if you make a positive change in a situation. Because you're dealing with a human and you are helping, you are there to help the horse. 
um, you may inadvertently put the horse in a situation where they are then put under more load, more strain and more stress. Now, I have certainly done this previously in the past. I have treated horses where I have said, look, you know, I can get the horse back to performance, but it cannot perform at the previous level. It must perform at a lower level. Yeah. But the riders have then turned around and performed the horse at a higher level and even higher from where it was previously yeah. because the horse feels brilliant. Now, that is, I, that puts me on a very perilous ethic, ethical yeah. background um, because I've done the right thing. I've made the horse more comfortable, but it's somebody else which is now loading that horse and putting it into more danger um, because it's, it's of a higher risk to, to re-injury. Um, so this isn't to necessarily say, you know, you shouldn't do this, but it's understanding the full effects um, of what you do um, and the individuals which you're dealing with. Now, this is where, as I say, having that conversation with individuals and being open and honest, you know, um, whether you have individuals which turn around and go, yep, yeah, no, just get it fixed, then you, you, it's your call. It's completely in your realm of turning around and going, no, I, I, I will get this horse up to a point that I, I can't take it any further because this person is, is the type of person who will push this horse and push it to breaking point. Um, and it's your ethical kind of uh, compass which controls that, really. Um, so it's, it's understanding the full effects of what the individual does because you're, you're there to fix the horse, but, it, but then also you're there to deal with the rider. What I do, I, I'm, it's not unusual for me to say, yeah, you can take it competing, no problem, but stay in the collecting ring. You're not competing. <laughs> you yeah. can have your day out, <laughs> bring a picnic, yeah. but uh, or take, it's usually a young horse. So just just stay in the collecting ring. So yeah. it is a and that, that, issue. That's why I say it's, 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 this is, you know, we're not just trying to talk about just the simple biomechanics and everything like that. It is also kind of, there is a, an ethical element to to having this conversation because if you are going into horses which are have mechanical complaints or, or, or problems, you you have to talk about the ethics um, on that level because um, rehabbing or, or correcting or, or doing rehab saddle fitting um, is very very difficult because people people are okay when it's broken. But as soon as it starts working, they kind of get greedy and they want more. Um, and then you have to kind of um, not necessarily control control that, but you have to curb it um, yeah. for the good of the horse. Um, um, and I've certainly walked away from situations where um, it could have been lovely, could have been lucrative and, and various things like that. And I've said, no, ethically, I'm, I'm not willing to put a horse in pain i can fix it but i know that this person is and has a reputation of pushing the horse till it breaks so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna do that and this is often why um we must keep a dialogue with open with the vet because if the vet says it can compete then yes there's an ethical issue and maybe the vet hasn't spent as much time with that horse as we have but yep. at least it kind of gets pushes the responsibility onto the vet rather than you know for us to uh, carry that ourselves so you know it's important for us to I'm keep yeah checking. I'm always I'm always a big advocate for um, open dialogue you yeah. know I, I I openly turn around to people I've got nothing to hide at all so if you've got nothing to hide everything's on an open plate you know um, I'll quite happily talk to vets I've I've had uh, very stern comp like conversations with some vets um, where I've said, look, I'm, I'm not comfortable doing this. I can quite happily do it, but I need your, your kind of um, understanding and knowledge that you want me to do this. I don't feel comfortable doing it, but if you want me to do it, I can. I've equally had conversations where I've disagreed with a vet openly. I said, no, I think your diagnosis is wrong. Um, I, I, categorically disagree and these are my reasonings the the thing is 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 when you're having these open dialogues with vets or any kind of professional when you have disagreements or you think there is a, a 
an ethical line which is being crossed. Um, as long as you are open um, and you explain yourself clearly and concisely and you put that in writing and you send it to them and you say, look, yeah. you know, it's all well and great having a conversation, you know, on the telephone and everything like that. But as long as you put it into writing and you send it over to them, you are protected in any way, shape or form. You are, you, even if it all goes peak tong and you know, terribly wrong and all of that. You can sit there and not necessarily do an ego thing of turning around going, see, I told you, little finger waggle. It's got nothing to do with that. It's turning around and going, this, this is also me trying to protect myself, trying to protect my customers, trying to protect, um, everybody really. Um, but it's, it's got to be in writing. Um, and it's, it's sending it over to them. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to kind of point your fingers and saying, I disagree with you. You can say, I disagree with you because of, this, 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 and this reasoning. And this is my logical understanding of what is going wrong. And this is what I think is going wrong. Um, but I'm more than happy to continue with what you suggest. You know, ultimately, we all work underneath that. Um, but just being open and honest and, and explaining your logic um, you, cause you've also got to see, see it from the other side of the world, which is the vets, you know, the vets are unbelievably busy. They are stressed. They are not experts in biomechanics. They are not experts in saddle fitting. They do a course on it, which is a couple of hours. That's it. It's that they, it is unless they're in that realm of expertise, it is not kind of what their, um, their specialism is. Now, the other thing to also realize is you are a specialist, you know, you are a, a specialist within a specialism. Um, you know, saddle fitting is a specialism. Remedial saddle fitting is even more of a specialism. Then you're talking about horse and rider fitting. That is even more of a niche, you know, so you're a niche within a niche within a niche. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's your knowledge, your depth of knowledge. Um, in some regards has to be better. Um, and, but you also have the ability to be a generalist because vets do not look at human biomechanics. Yeah. You look at human biomechanics that you, you've got 50%, which they don't even look at. They look at lameness. They look at hu equine biomechanics. They're not looking at human biomechanics. Now, if you are sat there with a piece of paper and you go, right, I'm, I disagree with your diagnosis because the rider has X, Y, and Z. And the horse has X, Y, and Z. Now, this is my logic of the reasons what's happening. That is my proof. That is what I, I think is, is going on. The vet can look at that and ultimately they can make their decision. But as long as you present the information, you know, you're covered. I think um, uh, what also sprang to my mind and, and for practitioners in general is that you need to remain within your insurance cover parameters. And so you've got to be very careful what you say and what you advise. And also to you must work within your level of competence within that which you've been certified for. So, yes, we all want to help the horse. No, we don't want them all, you know, crashed at competitions. But, uh, yeah, I think, as Bradley says, we've all got to keep the dialogue open with each other. A um, couple of comments and questions. Uh, yes, it's the same ethical dilemma when rehabbing navicular horses' feet. And yep. uh, feet can be the trickiest area here, both with vets and farriers. Yes, and yes. I, I thought of uh, this trend for the inertial sensors and gait analysis and lameness detection, uh, yes. and the fact that they they not they can't really detect um, bilateral lameness yet. <laughs> uh, yes. Just wondered if you had anything to say on that in relation to saddle fitting, so we don't stray too far from yeah. no, 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 no. checking. So. <laughs> Right. This is this is um, a little bit controversial, but ultimately, you know, technology is going to infiltrate into the equestrian world. You know, it, it is coming. It's slow. You know, the equestrian industry is very slow in the uptake of of um, technology. 
Um, but laneless locators and, and various things like that, they are coming. Um, to For a laneless locator to start diagnosing bilateral lameness, it is literally just a, a data collection and time. You know, they will be able to do that in time. Now, the difficulty is, is like always, they're, they're only as good as the data allows. They're only as good as, it's like a computer. Computers are brilliant at what they do, but they're only, they're only brilliant if you know what you're doing and you know what you're doing with it. Otherwise, you know, computers are absolutely diabolical. They're a pain in the ass. The, the thing is, is you look at a horse and you kind of go, right, okay, that horse is lame. But I've, I've equally looked at lameness locators where they've said, right, the horse is lame. And I've sat there and I've plonked the vet in front of the, the legs. And I said, well, it's not lame because you've got one leg longer than the other. So you've got a false lameness. It's not lame. It doesn't have a problem. It is because of the structure. So that you have one fundamental issue there is that it can detect lameness or asymmetrical movement, but you ne still need the human element in order to look at the individual. Um, and it's the same thing. You know, all of these data collection elements, they focus on the generalist approach they do not focus focus on the individual now as a saddle fitter you're going to be looking more down the ba barrel of data being given to you in terms of lameness locators um, and all of these types of data driven things and this is where ultimately i you know you need to be able to learn how to understand that data pick it apart and actually objectively um, take information from that data. You know, data is, is very interesting and very good, but it doesn't actually give you any insight. Data just is just information. It, it means nothing um, until you can start relating it and starting to find connections and, and interrelationships. Um, and it's, just, it's the same thing um, with the lameness locators and various things like that. All down to the interpretation, as always. Oh, absolutely! It's all down to the interpretation. It's not. A, it's not about kind of. It, as I said, it's kind of like computers. You know, if, if computer says no, it, it doesn't mean you have to accept it. It's looking at the individual. Um, <laughs> as I said, you know, the the you look at. I've I've sat there with some of the prominent lameness um, experts who have used data and lameness locators. And you sit there and go, well, the horse has got one leg longer than the other. So your data is now pointless because it's screwed. Um, you, what you've said is that horse is lame. And now it's not, it's not actually lame. It's just got an asymmetrical gait because you've got one leg bloody longer than the other. Um, so, so very, this is very quickly, I don't know if I missed it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I missed what? it or not, but how can you tell if one leg or the other from the actual, the carpal joint, fetlock joint on the front and then um, behind you can, the you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can do that just by, it, it's all about observation. So, um, so one of the things I do when I look at horses is you look at the hoof angles. Um, I am a bit of a nerd, so I measure the hoof angles um, on the anterior hoof angle and the lateral hoof angles uh, on both front legs. And you can sit there and you can then look at the position of the knee heights and you can measure from the fetlock up to the knee um, on both legs and you can notice a difference. You can also observe, sometimes observe a difference on, um, on a knee height. Um, but that goes back to the reasons why I, I'm a big advocate for measuring horses and having an a, a objective measuring process um, because I, I truly believe that you you need you need objective measuring processes in order to then make and manufacture and fit products. Um, otherwise, it's all just glorified guesswork. So, mm -hmm. but yeah. Any other questions? Uh, not so far. No, I think we've done the questions. Yeah. Okay. 
to move on. Um, yeah, right. So, saddle fit for the rider. Da, 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 da. Um, now, where with the horse um, we're talking about fitting a saddle is much more uh, about mechanics uh, in some regards. With fitting a saddle to a rider, there is an element of psychology involved in this. Um, so now when you're talking about the rider, you're talking about the rider's wants and desires. Uh, you're talking about their emotional state, if they're nervous, um, if they're particularly gun ho We're not just looking at mechanics, you know, are they balanced, are they symmetrical, all of that type of stuff. Um, you can go to a situation where a rider is perfectly balanced, perfectly symmetrical, but they are nervous, in which case they need a saddle which theoretically makes them feel more secure. Um, and it might be that they, they're just very nervous people. They have a horse which is placid and, and relaxed and everything like that, but they are just to have a nervous disposition, and that's not a problem. But they may end up needing a saddle which gives them more support and more comfort. Um, now, as we said, you know, riders, much the same like horses, come in various shapes and sizes. Um, but how do you fit a saddle to a rider? How is that process done? Um, that is very, very complicated um, because there are a variety of elements and aspects which affect how we fit saddles to riders and there's a lot of factors not only in mechanics but also also pathology so what i mean by this is to understand how you fit a saddle to a rider you also need to understand the various pathologies which can occur with riders such as disc injuries, hip issues, knee issues, ankle issues, um, if there's any kind of scarring or, or kind of abdominal issue. Um, all of these factors ultimately affect how the rider sits. Um, you know, if, uh, God forbid if any, any of you have ever suffered with a back issue, um, and like a damage to a disc or anything like that, Sitting down is, is very, very uncomfortable. Um, that is, if you've got an old historical disc injury, sitting in a saddle is, is, can be really uncomfortable. It can equally also help quite a lot because of the gentle rocking movement. But that's where comfort and um, making sure that you are balanced and you're not put into a position where the muscles are over uh, engaged is really important. Equally, if you've ever had a hip issue, issue i.e. Uh, arthritis in the hip or any kind of hip groin strain or anything like that, trying to stretch your legs over a horse's rib cage and, and sit akimbo on a, on a horse is quite, can be quite uncomfortable. Um, so all of these factors. Um, so when it comes to sitting to the rider, don't underestimate how important pathologies are and specific pathologies. Um, now I'm more than happy to sit down and talk about specific pathologies in terms of, you know, hip arthritis, knee arthritis, disc injuries, so on and so forth. They're, they're always quite good fun. Pathology is, is a very fascinating subject in itself. Um, but the, the core of what you're dealing with in terms of riders can be very pathology orientated, which is why when you take a case history, understanding if the rider has any issue is vitally important when trying to fit that saddle, not only to the horse, but also to the rider. Um, so, yeah. Now, this is a subject which is uh, hotly uh, talked about in circles of saddle fitting, um, which is the right, the fitting to the rider, the male and the female, um, and pelvises. Um, so it's, it's, it, there is a sub slide after this, which is all about pelvises, and this is where we get into a bit of fun. But um, as I said, there are differences between the sexes, uh, both mechanically and physiologically. Um, we, as I touched earlier, we we talk about uh, kind of the difference um, on the triad 
um, between the ischial bones and the pubis bone and the genitalia. Um, and that makes a difference in terms of uh, being a male or female. Um, it is fitting a saddle to a rider is much more than just simple pelvic shapes, although that is a lovely big banner which everybody follows after. The saddle fitting for the rider is not about just pelvic shape. It's also about femur angles, gluteal musculature, flexibility, psychology, physiology, confidence, emotions, all of these things. Um, so you're having to deal with all of that. But the primary thing you must know and understand, um, which you will likely do, is that the rider sits on top of the horse. Therefore, the horse reacts to the rider sat on top. Think about it like this. If you have a child sat on your shoulders, if the child is leaning over to one side, you will mechanically compensate for that child on your shoulders. That is exactly the same principle of what happens with the horse and the rider. If the rider is wonky on top, the horse will mechanically compensate. Now, there is a caveat to that, which is that that is on the assumption that the person, or if you're having a child on top of your shoulders, that the person yourself doesn't have any structural or physiological issues to start with. For example, if if I had a child on top of my shoulders and I had a leg length difference, that then changes the starting position for the child to be on my shoulders. Now, that is the same principle with the horses. If the horse is asymmetrically unlevel, and I, I'm just talking about the structure, uh, not, not the musculature yet, because musculature can change, musculature can evolve. I'm talking about structure, I'm talking about angles and bone length. Now, if those are asymmetrical, then you will have a rider sat on top of a horse which can equally be symmetrical but then the rider is going to compensate for the horse so this is where it goes right back to the beginning where we're talking about observation 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 you must observe because whatever you see may is going to impact the fit and the, the performance of the saddle and the rider later down the line, because it is basically one stacked on top of the other. Now, if the foundation is incorrect, so you know, a good analogy is, is, a, is a, of a horse, rider, and saddle, is a house. Um, if the foundations of the house are wonky, you can correct the rest of the house for the, for the wonky foundations, but you will always have one wall higher than the other or shorter than the other and so on and so forth you're always going to have one key rooms now that's not a problem but you've got to understand that because if you're willing to put up with that or if you're willing to adapt to products which can do that that's fine so a good analogy is is a house because if the foundations which represents the horse is symmetrical then the tr then the saddle which is the main body of the house the rooms and so on and so forth are symmetrical it means then putting the roof on which is the rider on top is easy but if the foundations are wonky then you can correct the the roof and make it symmetrical and, and even up top but the problem is is you then have to adjust the, the tree or the saddle uh, which is the main body of the house in the middle so some rooms are going to have to be shorter, some rooms are going to have to be taller at certain ends, um, and all of these types of things. So it's, it's very important to understand that the rider on top, although very important, is one of the last things, although everybody likes to think that the rider is so important um, in some regards. So here we're going to talk about pelvic shapes, which is lovely and complicated, um, or it can be, but we're going to try and easily glide through it relatively easy without, and if there's any questions, just throw
throw up, but that's never a problem. So, as we kind of mentioned, there are four pelvic shapes. Um, anthropoid, android, platypoid, and gynecoid. And they are all slightly different in terms of their shape, their position, and their angles. Um, but one thing which everybody must understand is that very few people are one group. You're not. It's a sliding scale. Um, so that what happens is you may be, as I've kind of said there, 90% android with a 10% anthropoid shaped pelvis. Or you could be 50% platypoid, 30% gynecoid, 10% android with 10% an anthropoid. This is, this is because of your genetic history and your gen genetic lineage. Those genetics are going to influence and change uh, the, the shape of your pelvis. Now, the one thing which kind of most people do forget about in terms of pelvic shapes, um, which coincides with pelvic shapes, is lumbar spine positioning. So, lumbar spine positioning is 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 a another extension of the the pelvic shape. The reason why we say is because the lumbar spine you have a, a lordotic curvature. What we mean by that is that the curve bends forwards or curves forwards um, or anterior towards the belly button. Um, now, if you have an exaggerated curvature, which can happen, you will see that curvature more often in a platypoid pelvis. Um, now, that will then change the angle of the pelvis now there are situations where because of lumbar damage or lumbar curvature but if you have an accentuated lumbar curve you will never get that pelvis into pelvic neutral because they've got such an acute angle in their pelvis that trying to put them into neutral will actually cause them more discomfort so this is where as a fitter sometimes you have to kind of go right do i fit to the to the rigid guidelines of I must have this athlete or this rider in a neutral pelvis or do I actually go this person is functional so it doesn't matter if their pelvis is anteriorly rotated by five degrees or ten degrees because they're not in pain they're comfortable and they're still able to move now that is ultimately your decision which you have to make day by day when you're doing the job. Um, that's not necessarily for an individual, a company or an industry to necessarily turn around to. We have, you know, an industry should turn around and go, that is your aspiration to get a pelvic neutral, but it doesn't mean you have to do it because sometimes it will cause pain and discomfort. Um, so, yeah, that is about the other thing to which we're starting to talk or people are starting to talk about is the inherent pressure points which occur with the different shapes of the pelvises. Um, anthropoid pelvis compared to a platypoid pelvis, gynecoid compared to android. They, they load their distribution, distribution of force differently. Now, this makes saddle fitting even more complicated because with a pelvis like a platypoid, which has a very wide distribution of tuberosities, um, your loading points, your ischial tuberosities, so your seat bones, are very wide apart, and they're generally quite big, and they're loading straight down. Now, that pelvis, because it's quite a wide, flat pelvis, will rotate um, anteriorly which means that they're also more likely to load up the pubis bone. Now, if they're more likely to load up their pubis bone, this in turn means their lumbar curve is exaggerated. So your loading mechanism now is more onto the pubis than necessarily the seat bones. Now, if you try and rotate that pelvis backwards, you're going to then overload the seat bones lighten the front of the pelvis but you may have a curvature in the back which doesn't allow that so all of a sudden you're trying to get the pel the platypoid pelvis to a neutral position and you just can't do it um and this is where as i say the the pressure distribution is really fascinating because in that situation you turn around and go is it worth it 
whilst with an anthropoid or an android pelvis, which is very up and down, the pressure points are going to be higher uh, slightly because their seat bones are slightly smaller. So, yeah, we have uh, every pelvic shape has pros and cons. Um, now, obviously, we're talking about the pelvic shape in relation to lumbar curvature. We also have to talk about it in terms of hip shape and hip position. Um, because um, it's something which I don't talk about here specifically, but you talk about the angle of the neck of the femur. Um, now, different hip, different pelvic shapes uh, typically can indicate different ang different angles of the neck of the fever. There's a lot of words when you're having to kind of talk about all of this together. So you've got <laughs> so again, I I'm giving you an example: a android shaped pelvis, which is a pelvis which is very up and down, very um, in the most polite way possible, a very Scandinavian, very small, skinny pelvis. You know the, the people who have uh, pelvises which are very, very small, very upright. Um, now, those hips which they have, their angle of the hip is also equally very upright because they have a very upright pelvis because the angles of the socket joint is at a slightly different angle. Um, so the problem is, is you're not going to get people with an android pelvis with a 90 degree bend or curve or angle um, in the neck of the femur, you know, they're not going to suddenly have an android pelvis and really wide hips. Um, what they generally do is they have an android pelvis and they have a very narrow uh, or upright angle of the head of the femur. Now, that in turn changes uh, how wide those legs can go. Um, and it changes the articulation surface and the loading mechanisms and various other things um, associated with hips. Now, hips, I can go on for hours and hours and hours about. Um, and if you want, I can do that. That's quite happy because it's quite fascinating um, because it's all hip angles. Okay. Um, uh, before you do, <laughs> I've got a couple of questions here. Also, Mark has gone crazy, but uh, the other no problem. So uh, a couple of questions. There's some marketing out there in saddle fitting in relation to male, female pelvis shapes. Do these four shapes apply to both sexes or is one sex more prone to any of the shapes over another? Right. So um, both pelvic shapes exist in male and female. They do. Um, but they are more exaggerated. There are more, there are, no, it sounds really weird. Um, there are stereotypically more variations or, or more extremes of variations within the female kind of uh, gender. So, for example, you will get men with what we call a platypoid pelvis. Those are men who, um, I'm going to say this in a terribly rude way, but those are the men who you look at and they they are pear-shaped, for example. Uh, it means that they have a very wide-based pelvis. Um, so pelvic shapes do exist in men, um, that, but you do not get the extremes that you do in women. Okay. Yeah. Um, Another couple of questions. Uh, I think I've answered one, but are there any observable features that would let us know which type of pelvis a person has? Oh, um, yes. Um, it depends how closely you want to get involved with the person because you're going to have to poke and prod places. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, yes, yes, there are ways to actually uh, do this. Um, it uh, it means that you require a tape measure, um, and you take various measurements of individuals' pelvises. Um, now, as I say, you, it, it depends how kind of intimate you really want to get involved with the individual. Um, if you are a female touching another female, then generally that's okay. You know, you, as long as you ask permission, um, it's absolutely fine. If you're a male. Um, you need to be very, very careful because you will, if you want to feel people, the 
and you want to take measurements, the measurements which you need to take are PS to PS, which is the posterior iliac, posterior superior iliac spine, which is a bony points at the back of the pelvis. Um, then you need to take the ASIS um, to ASIS, which is the front of the pelvis. Um, so you need to take the front measurement, which is just above the, the pubic uh, line. Um, it's two body points, just generally where your belt or trousers would sit. It's kind of two little bony nodules at the front. Um, now, this is the, so you need to take those two measurements, uh, both front and at the back. Um, then you need to take the distance between the, your ischial tuberosities, which are your seat bones. Um, so you need to basically either take measure on one ischial tuberosity and measure across to another tuberosity um, and feel for it. Um, and then what you can do is also feel for the width of the pub of the um, the seat bones or the ischial tuberosities um now that's where you do have to it sounds very horrible but you do have to palpate um and feel that um you don't necessarily have to feel that you can do taking those measurements you can actually um work it out um now there, there is an easier way of taking the ischial tuber tuberosity measurements um rather than necessarily copying a feel of people's buttocks and putting tape measures against it. Um, you can actually get them to sit in some hard, dense foam and get them to stand up. And then what you do is you can see the two imprints and impressions into the foam. Um, and then what you do is you basically kind of mark those and then you can take a measurement from that. Um, so there is a, 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 a way where you can take ischial tuberosity measurements without touching. So that is also quite good to do. Now, once you've got those measurements, it sounds really silly. Um, you can then compare basically on different widths and, and lengths. Um, so it becomes quite easy to do. Um, oh, and the other thing is that once you've measured the posterior PSIS, you can then measure the difference between the PSIS to ASIS. So back to front. Um, so basically, you're drawing a big giant square around the pelvis. Um, and that's the way you do it, really. Uh, another question. Yeah, I think you've answered that. How do we establish via the riders what shape pelvis they have? And... Do the front hip points, so the ASIS, have to be yeah. an approximation to avoid measuring any belly protuberance? They can be an approximation. Um, there are, <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> it's very, it's very okay. yeah, this is the problem is, is when you are measuring, because I was actually trying to, to explain, is the, the big problem at the moment is um, in the Western world is that because of our diet, we have become larger. We have put on more fat, basically. Um, now, that confuses a lot of the, the shapes of pelvises because you can have somebody who has a, an abundance of adipose tissue, um, I'm talking about it politely, um, around their midriff, which does affect uh, the perception which we can see. You know, you may look at somebody with a very large uh, stomach and, and buttocks, and you go, oh, Christ, they've got a big pelvis. And actually, structurally, underneath it, they're actually quite small, which is why we have to say you've got to measure from bony point to bony point. Now, you're absolutely right. If you're taking the front measurement and you have somebody with a with a fairly large uh, stomach, um, it does make it quite difficult. Um, now, there are uh, products out there where you can take a measurement um, without using necessarily a tape measure. Um, so you can get, a, a, so for example, there is a, a I butchered up a, a clamp, a sl what we call a sliding clamp, um, which you can buy at home base or whatever, and, and basically put two extenders on it so that I don't have to touch an individual. 
I can ask them to put it onto a bony protuberance at the front and then I can slide the other one up and down to put it exactly where the other bony protuberance is at the front on the ASIS, the opposite ASIS, and then I can take that measurement away and I can measure it separately. So I don't have to go near the individual and I don't have to manhandle their pelvis and their stomach and make them feel uncomfortable. Um, so there are ways and means if you're willing to think laterally. Uh, so you don't have to, you can get a pure movement, a uh, measurement that way without having to involve the curvature of the belly. Great. Thank you very much. I mean, from my point of view, um, it's, it's far simpler for the purposes of what we need it's far simpler uh, we use corrugated paper and get an imprint yeah. of the seat yeah. bone pubic bone and I, I think to me the how their pelvis is shaped that i can't do anything about that but what i can no, do is get some information from the corrugated paper and you know that also tells us whether they're misaligned and how they're loading their seat bones and also yeah from that shape how stable are they going to be is it an equidistant triangle so but again yeah as you were explaining that the femur angle coming out from the pelvis then becomes more relevant. So if an android pelvis, does that give you a longer leg position, i.e. a dressage rider? Good question. It doesn't give you a longer leg position <laughs> because you still have the range of movement within the hip. You know, if you have an android shaped pelvis and an and a open, what we call an open angle in terms of the head of the neck of the femur, you can still go into a show jumping position. The, the problem is, is that your eye will naturally, the person will generally have a longer femur, um, or in, it will, it will pull your eye to having more of a dressage leg position. Um, but it doesn't mean they still can't do the other things. It just means that because of the, the angle is more open, they're, ability to move i get into the jumping position over the fence and back up again is reduced you know their ability to 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 move is reduced um and that's purely because of leverage uh, it's it's not actually a problem with the joint per se but the, the android shaped pelvis does bring about other difficulties as well because the android shaped pelvis these are individuals which generally don't have a large amount of muscle mass in their gluteal region. It becomes very difficult and quite uncomfortable for those individuals if they're not having, if they don't have enough padding. And they, they can be very easily swamped by a seat which uh, pushes them around quite a lot because there's not a lot of them. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, great. Thank you. All right. Um, anybody, anything else so far? Uh, no, there doesn't seem to be. Okay. All right. Right. So how do we check saddle fit? This is a lovely complex issue on a variety of different levels. Actually, how about we throw this out there? To you guys how would you with all the information which we've now given to you how would you check the saddle i'll read out the answers in the comments yeah. they will be 10 seconds behind us so it might be oh. quiet for a minute <laughs> thinking time <laughs> yeah that's fine so we've got quite a mixed group here there are i think three professional saddle fitters podiatrists equine therapists we've got a coach riding coach or two so a lovely mixed group so hopefully we'll come up with some important methods so that this either non-therapists or even therapists or non-saddle fitters can actually do a fair job of checking saddle fit yeah. okay so oh, no none yet come on people this is up to you <laughs> three saddle fitters <laughs> I thought I'd have 30 comments by now. Okay, somebody wants to repeat the question. Uh, Suzanne, uh, what we're asking for is how would you, how would the group 
check saddle fit what tips can you give us what can we get from you as a group to be the most important saddle fit checks okay we've got static fit checking basic structural aspects having checked back of horse for pressure rubs yes yeah, so we start with the horse and see if anything corresponds so the saddle structure and uh, mapping that any problems with the saddle panel structure mapping that against the issues or hypertonicity etc any bumps bruises on the horse's back we can ask the rider how they feel it is their muscle memory may give them the skewed feedback uh, we've got look at rider range of motion and movement yeah and the ability in the saddle stability and ability to move yeah okay and also balance in alignment with the horse's center of motion yeah uh, check where the rider places the saddle yes that's something that i do get them to put it on the horse they will invariably fit it behind the horse's ears and check which girth straps they use yeah so we have to check the girth and we've got angle of point needs to match the scapular angle yes so the gullet channel needs to be sufficient width to not place pressure on the base of traps <laughs> and needs to have enough width to allow for axial rotation and uh, photos of balance stability in movement so take a photo yeah saddle panel needs to fit within the saddle support zone ideally yeah okay so we can map the horses back and uh, fit the panels within that area uh, then read an assessment with existing setup if nothing looks too far off and we've got saddle needs to be balanced front to back with the lowest part of the seat in the center of the saddle so horizontal balance with the lowest part of the curve in the oh yeah okay yeah the lowest part of the seat in the center of the saddle yeah okay so all quite technical so far good I think we've also, if we've got this picture in the middle of the rider sitting on the saddle and crushing down through the panels, we've got to make sure that the rider or the seat is an appropriate size for the rider. Yeah, and a, quite an important one. If there's any check you need to do, yes, the horizontal balance has to be good, static and dynamic, but just checking the pressure under the tree points, that's a huge one. And yep. where the uh, stirrup bars are so one of those uh, comments they're all absolutely spot on all of them one of them is more Im more important in some regards than all of the rest and that one is where the rider places the saddle yeah and that is absolutely i'm really glad that because obviously we're talking about anatomy and of, of mechanics and everything like that and i'm really glad that somebody brought that up um, and somebody actually kind of stated that because it doesn't matter if you come in and you fit this perfect saddle onto the horse and everything like that if the rider the very next day comes along and whacks it in completely the wrong position you could have the best fitting product in the universe but then somebody else because they're not educated and because they don't understand it and that is part of your job as a saddle fitter is to have that dialogue with your customer and have that conversation and to educate them and education doesn't have to be boring education can be fun and interesting where you sit there and you kind of go right okay this is where you put the saddle and this is where i put the saddle this is the reasons why i put the saddle here and this is the reasons why you put the saddle here but that is a very important factor because there's the last thing you want to do is fit the saddle make it perfect and then they come back the next day and they plunk their saddle into the normal place where they put the saddle and then they about two weeks later the horse is bucking and rearing and creating problems and they turn around and go oh you don't fucking know a thing um pardon my language <laughs> so then you end up getting blamed so the, you're up that that little comment is really important yeah um because what are you, what you're doing there is you are putting the responsibility onto the the individual 
And you are saying, right, okay, you tell me, you educate me about where you put your saddle. Um, and then it's, it's, then it's, it's part of your job to then re-educate them again to go, oh, right, okay, you're just putting the saddle too high up or too far back or, or whatever. And then it's, it, then people are more willing to, to take on what you're doing and the changes and everything that you're, you're providing. So all of those things, you know, saddle structure, pressure, kind of static fit, dynamic fit, rider range of movement, all of those things, absolutely spot on. But sometimes the most basic and fundamental thing, which is giving a rider a saddle and just going, plop that on your horse, show me where you put it. And it sounds so basic, but sometimes you do sit there and kind of go, Okay, you, you put the saddle in all the wrong places. No wonder you've got all of these problems. I think for me, and I check the saddle every time. I've been doing it for 20 years, check the saddle with the with the horse in a, a physio context. And I ask the, I just so, so often these riders put the saddle too far forward. And they I say, why? And they say, well, because it's going to slip back anyway. But what? I'm horrified by is that no saddle fitter has ever told them where to put their lovely new saddles, it would appear. Mm. Um, so a couple more comments here. I've had a horse lamed to the extent of needing hock injections because someone has put a fraction too far forwards and then girthed on two and four and it had sat on the shoulder for a year. It went sound when I moved it back and girthed it on one and three. It's horrific how these, there's just the knowledge is not there. Um, and again, that corresponds with the saddle being way too tight under the points of the tree, the panels being way too tight there. And they just, they nobody's told them to check the basic check before they get on. And I am a lot, I do move saddles back so, yes. Yeah. Sorry, that's the, the, the thing is, is no, no, no. It's, it's, this is the thing is, half the time you are a biomechanical specialist. That is your job as a rider, trainer, saddle fitter, so on and so forth. But you are, you know about biomechanics. You know about, you, you're, you're, you're on a course learning about horse and rider biomechanics. So you are trying to become better at what you do. Not everybody has that desire to improve they have the desire to be a better athlete but they don't they just think that's just train harder um they're not approaching it in the same level of detail now you can't begrudge somebody who who is um ignorant um if they just don't know this information yeah you can have a go at somebody if if somebody's a bit of an arrogant pain in the ass and kind of they think they know it and you're sat there going well hang on you've plonk the saddle in the wrong place here for, for this horse. I'm going to give you a bit of a stern telling off on this one. But you, that's, that's the difficulty is, is, you know, your job is not only to provide a product which works for the horse, which works for the rider, but also to educate the individual to make sure that then them as a community start improving and start evolving. Because ultimately that individual which you go off and sit and they, they put the saddle in the wrong place and you re-educate them to put it in the right place. That person is then going to tell the next person. You know, everybody goes to these yards and they're kind of like, oh, that saddle's a bit tough, too far forward. Oh, I'll just kind of shuffle it back on their friend's saddle or, or they're going out for a hack and they'll just go, oh, your saddle's a little bit far forward. Okay, well, my saddle fit told me that you've got to push it further back and so on and so forth. So that has an exponential increase within the industry and within the community. And that's ultimately what you're kind of trying to do is is you're looking at equine welfare in the long term so wholeheartedly you know it is education 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 but it's it's how you pass that education over and that information to the individual it is frustrating because we've got a plethora of expensive biomechanics courses they're coming thick and fast but yeah. you know nobody's told them to put the saddle back a centimeter or two so Everyone assumes that the saddle's in the right place. The saddle fitter gets a telling off for a poor fitting, but the you know often the therapist will critique without checking that the saddle's in the same place that the fitter fitted it to. So, yeah. yes, it the works. Other, the, other, 
it works both ways, but there's also a third element in all of this, which is, um, or third and fourth element to this, which is historically um, the education of fitting saddles and various things like that um, was primarily taken up within the pony club. And the pony club always said, you know, you, you plonk a saddle on the, on the horse's back, you push it back as far as you can, and then you stop. That's it. You know, if, we, if you've done pony club, um, you know, you always just plonk the saddle up on the wither and then you push the saddle back. And then as soon as it stops, that's where the saddle should be. Um, yeah. So that was the old school methodology. Now that is no longer applicable really because we all understand how shoulder rotates further backwards and so on and so forth. Now, so you've got the old historical, you know, pony club me me methodology or mentality and approach. But you also have a fourth element, which is to do with saddle manufacturing. Um, and this isn't about bashing saddle manufacturing um, at all. This is just talking about it. Is people will look at horses' backs and they will go, right, there's a, there's a dip and a curve behind the horse's shoulder. And then they will look at and say, well, I know that saddle shouldn't go beyond the 18th rib. Right, okay. So what they instinctively do is they just go, well, the panel is that shape and that's where it, it fits into. So it's not a, it's not a, um, a massive leap to realise that sometimes people just put the saddle where they think it should be because the shape and the design of saddles or trees or panels are shapes like that. So they just go, well, surely if it's shaped like that, then that's where it has to be. So you end yeah. up having this kind of perverse kind of belief that if a panel or a tree or a saddle is shaped like that, that's the way it's shaped because it's it's done that for years and that's how it's supposed to be. So that's where it's, you know, it's supposed to sit right up butted oh, over the shoulder. Um, and that is, you know, as I say, an, an inherent um, lack of explanation and talking and, and kind of opening up within the industry to educate not just saddle fitters because saddle fitters know this but it's 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 the the lack of responsibility to educate the community um as a as a whole um so yeah it's you know it's it's i've, I've been to you know there's a there's a, a lovely um lady called Kay humphreys who uh, the original founder of, of basically the whole concept of saddle fitters um who openly turns around to anybody who fits a saddle um, and goes, right, shove the saddle back for another t another two inches to allow for shoulder rotation. Yeah. Um, you know, she, she she does that to every saddle. You know, everything is always shoved back an extra, you know, go to a point of shoulder, go back another two inches, right, okay, that's where the saddle should be. Um, you know, and again, that's a broad stroke, Um for uh, for individuals um, doesn't mean it's right doesn't mean it's wrong it's it's not about that but it, you can easily understand if a panel or a saddle is shaped a certain way you can easily believe that an individual who isn't educated will just go well it's shaped like that that's the way it's supposed to be plonk it where it needs to be yeah a uh, couple more comments. Uh, it's so difficult as it is so universal to see photos of saddles on shoulders. I find that despite writing it down at every check, it can take several times to get them to keep doing it. So consumer compliance is is uh, a challenge for every profession, yes. not just saddle right. fitting. There and is a trick got... to doing that with or getting people to suddenly realise and figure it out. It either involves you with chalk and coloured pens or pencils or sticky notes um, or um, what do you call them? Um, Post-it notes um, and sticking it on the horse's shoulder at standing and then picking up the horse's front leg, getting the person to obviously see where the shoulder is. They put the sticky note onto the horse's shoulder. And then what they do is they put, you pick up the front leg and then they put the next sticky note where the shoulder posteriorly rotates to. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you plonk the saddle on and all of a sudden they suddenly realize they've got two yellow sticky notes of where the shoulder stands and then yeah. where it's going back to. And all of a sudden these people suddenly go, oh, 
oh, now I understand why you keep trying to shove the saddle back and you keep telling me off, it's the off the shoulder. Because a lot of these, it's, it's about getting people to feel uh, and, and uh, get them involved. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of it is, as I say, you, 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 it's creating that dialogue with the individual um, and going, right, copper feel, feel this, get involved, this is your horse, this is, you know, you're doing stuff to benefit them and their horse. Um, and it's, it, I use a lot of visual aids. I, I draw on horses. I put sticky notes on horses. I do all sorts, um, just to get people involved, to, to get them enthusiastic, to get them understanding why we do certain things rather than just going, going, right, this is how it's supposed to be. Why? Well, because I told you so, because I have so much knowledge. It's, it's not that. It's like, nope, come on. You, you want to know about this. Then I'm going to help you. Then, of course, uh, I don't want to spend too much on this particular point, but then we start stepping on uh, other professionals' toes, potentially, because I know that a lot of saddle fitters don't appreciate us therapists coming along and saying, well, this is how you saddle fit, because that's a bit of a, a grey area. So you have to be quite tactful and just perhaps simply say, look, the horse, if I move the saddle back or whatever, it can move better. Or if I put a saddle pad on, it can move better. So, yeah, you um, have to demonstrate rather than just say, my 10 rules of saddle fitting says this. A couple more comments so we've we've got uh, Suzanne's gave, giving a talk to the Pony Club about saddle fitting <laughs> next <Fantastic>. week. <laughs> we've loaded her up there. Yeah. I think another comment. I think the problem is made worse due to modern breeding of short-backed horses. So insufficient room. That is rife. Yeah. And uh, I'm not a fan of fitting saddles or trees over. Uh, the back of the saddle for various reasons yeah the joys of being a wide horse specialist so many short backs and so many large riders yeah. and yeah we have that as a general problem and i'm sorry to say that i see so many professionally fitted saddles that are too long if moved back to the right place and yeah. you can allow for shoulder rotation if you fit with a wider tree and matching scapula angle and but then you need to use appropriate shimming system so pads yep. as you can't just flock up the panel as it becomes a sausage yes and getting them to take a photo stood well back not relying on a piece of mane etc helps a lot yeah that's a good one and because many horses simply don't have enough room to put saddle that far back and not go past t18 well then the horse and rider just are not going to be a match so yeah, lots of... Uh, there, is, there is a... Dis yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a disparity um, on, a, on a couple of things is that a lot of horses are very short-backed and we have riders which are now very long. You know, you've got to think about the evolution of human beings, evolution of human beings. We are getting taller, um, which means... And that, that's why, uh, historically, this sounds very odd, um, you used to kind of uh, go back about 20 or 30 odd years um you would have a 16 inch tree for a 16 hand horse it sounds really old but it was it, uh, that's the old methodology of, of fitting yeah. saddles and this is oh this is old methodology and then if you had a 17 hand horse you would have a 17 inch tree um that was the logic back then that has now been obviously superseded but the the you've also got to understand that the the trees which are designed uh, are designed for riders. Uh, so a 17-inch tree is gen sometimes you will put a, a rider into a 17-inch tree. They're not because the horse needs a 17-inch tree, but because the rider needs a 17-inch tree because they got such long bloody legs. Yeah. Now, that is not a, necessarily a problem with the horse. That is a problem within uh, the industry. And as I say, this is, this is not about bashing industries or anything like that. This is just about being open and honest and having these conversations. Now, the other thing is also which was flagged up um, or talked about was uh, not extending beyond the 18th rib. Now, there is a little bit of controversy on that, uh, being open and honest about this. Um, there's a, a very commonly a misconception that you don't go beyond the 18th rib because in theory, it causes compression or loading onto the horse's kidneys. From an anatomical point of view, that is absolutely 
absolutely rubbish. The kidneys are not located at T80. So if you were ever fortunate enough to see uh, an anatomical uh, dissection, the kidneys are not located that high up. Um, the reasons why it is commonly uh, not sought after to put a saddle further back than T18 is because the lumbar spine loading mechanism is not, in some horses, not strong enough. And it's to do with physics and, and various things like that. So if you keep putting the rider further and further back, um, then you overload the lumbar spine uh, muscles, the lumbar erector spiny muscles. Um, but also from a physics point of view, if you put the rider further and further back, um, you are no longer sat on the apex of the thoracic spine lifting mechanism. Um, you are sat behind the apex, which then means that you are perpetually and eternally behind the movement. Um, so yes, that is the reasons why it is not the, the commonly missed thought of concept that you're going to cause compression on the kidney. Um, if you ever, if you want, you know, it sounds very odd, but you can look up uh, the position of the kidneys in relation to the horse's spine. They're not close to T18. They're actually closer um, to the pelvis and the LS junction or the lumbosacral junction. Hmm. So. My, my experience is that if the saddle's too long and there is some compression there just past the thoracolumbar joint that the horse in order to stabilize there in that region the horse develops very thickened hypertonicity of the musculature there to stabilize that junction because it is yeah. a piece of the spine which the thoraco the thoracolumbar joint has two very different vertebrae joining together they're hugely yeah. similar yeah that's, that's that's the exact reason it is not it's not because of the commonly held belief that you're going to put compression onto the kidneys that's the reasons why i was saying it is it's mm. not because of that you know it, yeah. people say that because of inhuman anatomy but it's not it's oh. com it's completely different um you actually do it because of you don't want to load up the kind of um the T uh, L1 and L2 um, because of the position and the angle of the fat or the, what we call the facet angles um, mm -hmm. between T18 and L1 and it's, it's different loading me mechanics and it's the way the lumbar erector spiny muscles then blend into the thoraco um, lumbar fascia and the thoraco lumbar muscles um, mm -hmm. so you get quite commonly an, an overdevelopment which and hypertrophy which is creates untoward issues um, Mm. in other areas so yeah you, you that's the reasons why it's not because of the held commonly held belief that you put pressure on the kidneys um, mm. all myths i'm sure that's not the only one <laughs> yeah. um, okay so what we need to do i think we've got a film short film coming up next yeah, yeah. which you can pause at different times so we need to really get get these some basic saddle fit checks that we can do so for coaches for non saddle fitters so that we know when to refer to the saddle fitter not to tell them how to do their job but when to actually flag up a problem so from all that information we've got to uh, nail down some uh, some techniques here so off you go <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to run through the video first and then we'll go yeah. back over it. Yeah.
Right. So that's the run through of the video. Um, right, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. So, so in that video, there's quite a lot in that video. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's all. No, it's absolutely fine. There is, Told there you I've been doing it for 20 years, so that's not even <laughs> no. all of it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, trust me, I, I can well believe. Um, so, yeah, there, there is quite a lot in that um, in terms of kind of the things which we can kind of see and do, really. One of the big things is obviously where you start chalking up, um, which is absolutely fantastic um, because that, a, that acts as a visual aid for the customer, um, yeah. but it also acts as a good reference point. Um, so I'm always a big advocate of, of chalking up. Now, what is, what, what's happening here um, for people who know or, or don't know, uh, if you know, sorry, I'm going to kind of explain stuff which you already know, um, is you're, de you're deliberately doing rotation um, and you're twisting that horse's spine um, and you're noting that the apex of the movement um, is just where you kind of poke your fingers, um, generally around about T13, T14. Um, so it's the transition area. Um, now that's the reasons why you do that movement is because horses move in diagonals. No horse moves in a linear pattern of movement. It is always across a diagonal. Uh, walk is a full time beat, so there's always a cross diagonal movement pattern going on uh, across the horse's spine. In trot, it's a two time beat, so there's always a cross diagonal across the horse's spine. And then in a canter, again, cross diagonal movement. And when we say cross diagonal, it means that there is, a, if you ever look at a, um, a certain breed of dog, uh, i.e., a Labrador, um, you will on occasion see a Labrador which moves the front left and the back left at the same time on the same side. That's when we talk about linear movement and you've got cross diagonal movement. The reason why you rotate the pelvis is to allow for rotation to understand where the transition is and where the muscular tension is. So that is a definite um, within the industry. You know, you should be doing that to see what's going on there. As we say, you know, you're marking it up, you're chalking it up, which is brilliant. Um, feeling for the muscle tension down the horse's back is really important because what you're doing is you're running your fingers down the horse's back. Now, the one caveat which I put on to this is you don't do it once um, because that's like me putting my hands on your back and poking you in the back. You're going to react initially. Now, if I'm doing that two or three or four times and you react in exactly the same place, there's the muscle tension, there's a problem. Um, if you just do it once, it could be a reaction through touch, but then that's also dependent on various factors such as weather. Um, you know, if you're doing that in the summer, it's very different to doing it in the winter. Um, what you can see here in this picture is where the, the saddle and the, the gullet uh, or gusset uh, is where the, the spine is as well so you've got to make sure that there is enough lateral clearance and when i say lateral clearance i mean clearance on the left and the right hand side of the spinous processes um so that you're not creating a problem there we go now yeah this is this is um just a lovely bit of information that you're kind of saying about uh, the width of the spine in comparison with the gullet. Um, now, that's, um, so just going back. It's also worthwhile um, in terms of the chalking. Um, which is where you're, what you're doing there is, is just over the rib angles. Again, it's, it's worthwhile doing that, um, within a fitting process, um, to help with understanding how wide the panel needs to be. So you're then not putting load mechanisms onto the horse's rib angles. Okay. So this 
part is now talking about the girth in relation to the saddle and how the difference is um, from below and, and above and how different they can be. Now, I'm not sure you want me to start talking about girthing structures and, and, and the mechanics and how to do that. So I don't know whether you want me to go into that, because that is a deep rabbit hole I could easily go down. So I, I'm not sure. I think I might leave that one. Right. So uh, palpation of the shoulder blade. Um, so this is where we start kind of picking up the horse's leg. So you, this is where I was saying about putting a post-it note onto the shoulder. Right. Um, so this is where you've got the shoulder rotation. This is where I was talking about with the post-it notes, um, which is quite good to do. So measuring the shoulder, chalking it up static, and then lifting the shoulder or lifting the leg to rotate the shoulder posteriorly um, is also quite good as well. I'm not going to touch the jumping uh, position. I'm going to stay far away from that one. Well, what we'll do, we'll, we'll bring you back for the saddle fitting course. That's what we'll do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it, it, so far, as I say, what you're doing is, is absolutely spot on. You know, you, you've measured, you've chalked up, you've kind of given your you, yourself the plane of areas to, to work with it. Um, obviously, checking the panel angles and making sure that the right curvature of the horse's back Um and they follow the curvature. Again, as what you're doing there, sticking three fingers in. Um, now, the three finger rule um, is quite a fascinating uh, little rule, and it's quite fascinating in terms of the history. But it's all to do with basically padding. Um, well, sorry, what I was trying to do there was get my whole hand in, but you can't do that on yeah. a close contact saddle. So to feel the whole no, withers right down, and I couldn't just couldn't do it. So sometimes I have to ask someone with a small hand to get in there and just check that the withers are clear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So here you've got the different angles between the wither and the the, the saddle panel, well, the saddle tree, sorry. Um, and there is a disparity there. This is why having a flexi curve is really important. And it is your tool of, um, tool of authority on that one, um, your flexi curve. And they do lose their flexibility after uh, a while, don't they? Yes, they do. Now, the other thing which I personally quite like is the element where you uh, put a tree on a horse's back and you can see in that picture um, that that tree, you've got gaping holes uh, where it loses contact. Um, mm -hmm. Now, in from the aspect of physics, um, that means that certain areas of that tree are going to be overloading rather than distributing the force across the entirety of that tree. Um, that means that that tree is going to load. There's going to be areas where there's no loading going on onto that tree and then into the horse. Um, it means that other areas are going to be overloaded. Right. Um, so that is a, an important thing. Uh, to, to I, It's a personal thing. I, I like plunking trees on. Um, now here, you know, you're looking at the stirrup bars, which are bane of my life um, <laughs> on a lot of uh, levels. Um, and obviously you're talking about the stirrup bars digging into the, mm. the horse's back. Um, the reason why I talk about stirrup bars as the bane of my life are to do with um, gullets and gullet bars changing and changing them wider and, and fl what we call flare. So it's flaring out the, the gullet bar um, because everything has an equal and opposite reaction. If a gullet bar flares out, then you've got to have something's got to go in. Um, and generally speaking, that is the stirrup bars, uh, which then end up digging in, which you can see on this final picture. Mm -hmm. um, so feeling for, um, kind of pressure points underneath the stirrup bars is really, really, really important. And the way you do that is by 
manhandling the tree and kind of copying a feel of the panel or the underneath of the panel um, where the stirrup bars are. Fantastic. <laughs> so really, it's just go back to school and revise your physics GCSE, um, really, mostly. Right, so, well, no, no. It's, it's, so I, I, I will openly admit I'm, I'm slightly biased on in terms of physics because I, I think there is a lack of um, physics and, and mathematics on, in, in fitting saddles. Um, so I, uh, please take it yeah. with a pinch of salt. I will always no. look at it through that lens. But um, I, it is I physics. Yeah, it is. Yeah. To me. It's just gravity and yeah. what the what everything does to fight against it and pressures and if you if this is too tight here then it will be way too tight with a rider on top um okay yeah. so is there anything else so if i should if i was to show the group that film a longer version of it but what would you add to this they've already done a bit of rider saddle fitting in there uh, just the assignment that they've just done uh, what would you add to those checks that we've just seen on the film in terms with the horse um i wouldn't actually add a lot um okay. what i i would add is it's going to sound very odd is the assessment of the saddle um but i don't know whether you're going to be doing that um, uh, yeah it's actually on the end of that film but i kind of knew we wouldn't uh, right yes yeah. Yeah. So, so that's that's where I say, you know, this is where you would then need to assess the, the saddle which they're in and the tree which they're in. You know, that's where you look at the stitching, the leather, the, the as, as what you've already said before, is the wear panel, the wear on the panels. Um, okay. All of those, you assess the symmetry of the tree, the, you know, all of those types of things um, because you have to. Yeah. Well, I think what I'm going to do, I've taken screenshots of the questions because obviously, you know, we could go on all night, but we, you know, we haven't yeah. book, booked you for the night. Um, yeah, so <laughs> if I email you those questions, maybe you could just uh, shoot me back some replies. Yeah, that's no problem at all. Great. And uh, uh, I think if we... If we leave it there for now, otherwise, yeah. you know, it could go on. Maybe there's definitely room yeah. for another session, I think. So, um, now, one of the things which I wanted to briefly talk about uh, right at the beginning, which I mentioned about physiology, because every all of this is like, focused on anatomy. Um, now, there's one thing which I do want to kind of flag up in all of this is um, do be aware of physiological problems which can impact saddle fitting. Now, this is very important. I know it's at the end, and I know you're tired and everything like that. But if you want me to talk about it further, I can. But I'm going to briefly talk about it. So, yep. for example, um, horses with metabolic conditions, such as PSM or fatigue-based kind of conditions, um, the, you will fit those horses or need to fit those horses differently to a horse which doesn't have a metabolic slash fatigue or muscular fatigue problem. The reason being is because the muscles will contract and obviously fatigue a lot quicker. Um, therefore, fitting those and the ranges of movement of those horses and the shoulders and the back will be different. So this goes back to your original element of observation and diagnosis and, and getting information. If you have a client which turns around and goes, oh, I have a horse with PSM or a metabolic condition, fitting a saddle to that horse is going to be a little bit more complicated because you have to bear in mind that those muscles will fatigue quicker. Therefore, the compressive forces which I will require with horses and balancing the rider is going to be of a higher importance. Um, because if your throw, if the whole rider's weight is being thrown around the horse, then they that's going to fatigue the horse even quicker. Which is then going back to various exercises to be done for riders in terms of strengthening exercises, core stability, all of that kind of palaver. But there's also exercises which you need to do for the horse as well to strengthen it up. So yes. Yeah. That's why I just wanted to quickly say that because I said that right at the beginning. I needed to 
kind of talk about it because we're talking about the anatomy quite a lot and quite often we need we uh, we forget about the physiology and yeah. how that impacts the horse's anatomy can i just clarify so you're saying that the muscles fatigue quicker no. does that mean that physically if you're say looking at that horse on a treadmill that those muscles are behaving differently morphologically for example than a horse with normal musculature is there that level yes. of compromise with them yes they, they will get uh, so if they're on a treadmill you video them and you then video them for say five minutes at the beginning and then you video them five minutes at the end you will notice that all of a sudden the horses are actually moving differently now that is also a benefit but the the reason being is is like with fatigue based um issues and there's multiple different kind of physiological problems with fatigue based issues uh, or mm -hmm. fatigue based conditions um, one of them is the, to do with the mitochondria within uh, the, the cellular structure mm. and the way the inactive and myosin cells kind of contract and, and work. Um, so if you've got a body or a muscle which is fatiguing a lot quicker, mm. um, then that will cause the muscle to then go into cramp, spasm, contracture, so on and so forth, which then you imagine you doing exercise but then your muscles one kind of your muscles are starting to fatigue quicker your body then compensates to use other muscles to keep you going right now you imagine you've got a little person sat on your back who's telling you you've got to keep going you've got to keep going you know you've only done 20 minutes half an hour you've got to keep going um what's going to happen is you're going to get muscular compensations because of the physiology because of the fatigue um right. within the physiology um, which is going to change your um, fitting of a saddle. Now, also compound that is you've got a rider which is landing on top of that horse's back. Now, as we know, when horses or when muscles are impacted, i.e. if they have an impact, i.e. you hit a muscle, the muscle will go into a micro-contracture, which at a microscopic level is going to basically cause a muscle to contract. Now, if you've got a horse which is being asked to work and it's got an impact, the muscles are going to doubly fatigue, basically. Wow, that's that's super interesting. I so find all of a sudden physiology becomes, in those cases, uh, it massively impacts your fitting process. So you may end up padding a huge amount for a horse with PSM just to try and protect. Wow. So uh, the way the way I check for that is that for me I want to know the breed of the horse and you know I do you know like to match the horse's gait with the breed breeding so for me a horse if it's not cadent or as cadent as it was bred to be that's a big red flag to me that tells me yeah. there's something wrong and then when the riders put on and that horse does not move in the way it was bred for then that indicates a deeper problem but i guess in our history taking uh, if there are any metabolic physiological issues then we should uh, not be worried about calling up the vet and say hey can you just explain to me a bit further i'm checking or i'm doing my therapy or coaching could you just help me explain this and i'm sure the huge majority of vets would just love to do that yeah, so of course they would. You, know, yeah. they're, you know they're there to help as, as much as you are you know they, it's, and you know nobody knows everything you know they certainly shouldn't um otherwise it gets terribly boring otherwise um and yeah, most vets are absolutely fine. They they want to have a chin wag and chat and okay, right, this is what, you know, PSM is, it's X, yeah. Y, and Z, you know, this is a metabolic condition, this is what it is. You know, go and research this, go and look it up, you know, this is a good website to research and have a look at, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um but it's it's this is this is the thing, is that don't just always think anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. Yeah. Because it, there's also physiology compared in to, or, or which is important into this, which will affect the anatomy. Um, so this is why it's really important to sometimes just go and go, right, okay, is there a physiological condition such as a metabolic condition or, or anything like that? Which is getting more and more common now. 
yes. much more common. Uh, okay, just another 15 seconds. There's two questions here. Uh, would you advise assessing a horse with metabolic condition before and after an effort uh, to assess their fatigue and how it changes their movement? I say yes. Yep. And then the second Absolutely. question, I think, which is why you need to get the riders on board. Have to, if you're therapists. And uh, I think, uh, another question, I think shock absorption is super important for all horses and regular panel materials don't really do the job, amen, especially if there isn't a lot of adipose tissues. And yeah, it's that old myth, you, you don't need a saddle pad or just a thin cloth if uh, the saddle fits correctly so yeah we get into padding territory and what the horse and rider combination needs so uh i'll, yeah. I'll ask um, you to round up there bradley because you must be wanting to <laughs> um, yeah don't even don't even get me started in terms of padding material um <laughs> that is um a massive bone of contention within me i will openly tell people now is that i'm working on a way of padding i'm working on something very 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 clever um for mm. panels yeah. um and to do, to do with shock absorption and various things like that um it's physics at the end of the day it's physics yes it, yes it is but it's it's also um it's material science for various things like that and it, i'm oh. i'm currently working on something very very innovative um yeah for for that because it's one of my big bones of contention is is it's not measured and calculable and it bloody well should be um yeah so yeah mm. so uh, so you're the, the person who said that you know they are absolutely correct the current kind of methodology or thinking behind it is uh, very limited um so yes fantastic don't, even get, don't ever get me started on bloody close contact saddles even worse um, <laughs> that's why i showed you this film <laughs> oh, very polite. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the close contacts is um, uh, it's uh, it, it was a lovely um, uh, trick. It, it was it was a trick of the uh, industry, basically, um, yeah. a, a way of parting with a lot of more money for getting a lot less. And, oh. um, they haven't packed up science and, and various things like that. So it caused me, as a therapist, it caused me more problems with close, co close contact saddles um, than it was worth it. Um, so, yeah. Wow. Well, I think we've all invited ourselves to Oxford so <laughs> to come and visit you uh, when the COVID restrictions are off. And, uh, yeah, there's a, a, a whole saddle fitting course ready to run here. So you've got the job. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, um, yeah, we will just, just wait until what I release in terms of the equine theory. Um, so I think that's going to ruffle a couple of feathers on that one. Uh, well, equ equitation science is, uh, as I read it, it's very poor, and there's even papers on it's poor. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's all changing. And, yeah, so I, I had a couple of thank yous uh, in my oh, private right. messages. So they're very, very appreciative. And uh, thank, yes, they would love to stay much longer and they would love to know about saddle pads and, and all that stuff. But I'm, I'm very grateful for you for uh, inspiring them this evening to start looking at this stuff, just looking for oh, themselves. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, thanks a million. A big pat That's on the problem. back for you. And for God's sake, get this saddle out that you keep... <laughs> So to answer that, um, at the moment, um, we are hopefully going to be getting it all um, in April. Um, so we're yeah. looking at May, uh, May, June time, uh, which is going to be kind of hitting everybody, really. But pretty soon we're going to start um, coming out and actually doing our, our pretty version um, and because the one which I threw out there ages ago, which looked ugly as sin with a too high a candle and version like that, was um, essentially a way of just kind of uh, getting upsetting people, people. To, <laughs> upsetting people in the most polite way possible, um, which is always good fun. Um, but it's it's now we're we're going to be releasing a prettier version, um, wow, an aesthetically pleasing version, um, 
but then uh hopefully may june we start um kind of really hitting it um in terms of and i'm doing research and, and various things like that so i will openly admit now that i've been playing around with a uh, sprung steel gullet bar um so uh, we're using a potentially an interchangeable gullet bar which has a, a, a degree of spring and flexibility in it uh, which is due to me, uh, coming out so that reduces even more any compression over the shoulders and, and allows for greater shoulder rotation and wow. so yeah so um yeah we're not idle behind closed doors we might be relatively quiet but i there's there's a lot of stuff which i'm trying to revolutionize behind closed doors yeah. so, and and can you does that saddle happen to be able to fit behind the horse's ears for the riders especially to put it on <laughs> it, yes it does um <laughs> so yeah it can it can do well this that, that was actually one of the reasons why i designed it that way or a certain way is that it's there's, there's it allows for um saddle or riders to theoretically put the saddle in the wrong place um hey uh, that's brilliant it, so there's a there's a degree of um, laxity deliberately built into it. So. Excellent. Well, you've got a page of thank yous here. Yep, great talk. Thank you, and keep waving the flag for us. Yeah, uh, yep. so much great information. Thank you. That was really interesting. Thank you. That was great. Thank you for a great talk and an ooh. <laughs> so thanks a million, Bradley, and thank you very much That's for no staying late. I'll. Um, Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll get the check off straight away. <laughs> no, it's no rush, don't worry. And yeah, we hope to see you soon. And yeah, good luck uh, with the launch. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. So, well, thank you. Right. Not a problem okay. at all. Thank you very much. Um, okay. And say, if you ever want more information, just give me a shout. Yeah, I, I will. <laughs> thank you, Bradley. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye, right. you too.